Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Matt Schoen Sociology Experience. Going to be continuing our discussion on gentrification today. And the material we covered today, uh, in conjunction with the material that we covered on Monday, promises to be very helpful uh, as you write that last reaction paper that you have to write for me. I know we've been doing a lot of work here. Um, please know I appreciate it. And please know that uh, there, are, there are benefits. There are real strong benefits to getting the majority of your points taken care of prior to these last couple of weeks when inevitably chaotic things will continue to occur and the, the chance of uh, uh, unpredictable things happening um, likely rises and likely uh, goes up. So I wanna cover the outcomes of gentrification today. Uh, last time I described and defined the process of gentrification and the causes of gentrification. Today, what I wanna do is uncover the effect effects of gentrification with a special focus on what is often implied or understood to be the primary thing to fear or to worry about with gentrification. Um, and that is that is displacement, displacement of longtime residents, people who have lived in a specific community for a long time, people who are perhaps at a, a, a socioeconomic status that makes them more vulnerable um, to displacement. Um, you should know that uh, we have already established that this is one of the most controversial trends in urban affairs, and it's not hard to see why. The idea that someone who has lived in a community for 25 years now has to leave it because they can't afford to stay where they are anymore. Yeah, part of that's just capitalism, but the other part of that strikes the vast majority of us as a bit unfair. And, 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 and it strikes many community residents themselves as a bit unfair uh, because if they lived in the place when nobody wanted to be there, why should they have to move all of a sudden exactly when it's becoming attractive, exactly when the quality of life is starting to increase. And that does happen as a result of uh, gentrification. Um, so towards the end of this, we will go over uh, how much displacement actually occurs and what is the extent, the true extent of gentrification um, nationwide. Another thing to keep in mind is that gentrification is by no means limited to the United States. It is not an America only thing. Gentrification is being discussed all across Europe as well. Um, uh, especially Berlin. Berlin is a, a city that is a one of my favorite cities in the world and and be a shockingly affordable European capital to both visit and to uh, live in. Um, and so what Berlin has done, the Berlin uh, mayor has taken the fairly unprecedented step of freezing rents, all of them, whether you're in a low income area or a very posh high income area, all rents have been frozen uh, for the next five years. Now that, um, and I say for the next five years, it's really the next four because this happened about a year ago. Um, and so that's one of those things that 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 uh, appeals to the German sensibility of fairness, the fact that everybody's getting their rent frozen, whether they're paying a little or a lot. Um, but it's also meant to be a one-time just sort of freeze in the moment and saying, look, we think that the city is changing too fast. We think that the city is changing in a way that's out of our control. So let's just hit the pause button, figure out who needs support, figure out what's going on in the neighborhoods and kind of move from there. Um, but that's what you're seeing here. This gra uh, this uh, picture that you're seeing is, is actually resistance. It's graffiti resisting gentrification in Berlin, Germany. So this is by no means limited to just what you see in New York, Los Angeles, Seattle, or Boston. Okay. Um, now, I previously went over the causes of gentrification. I talked about the job growth, specifically in the fire and the tech industry. I talked about the rent differentials that created a real nice market opportunity for people who didn't have a lot, uh, who, who had a lot of earning potential, but not a lot of earnings saved up. I talked about the increasing urban preferences among my generation and specifically among creative types. We talked about the fact that nobody my age wants to have family anymore uh, because that's just really scary. We talked about the increase in quality of life within urban areas and, in my opinion, the most severe cause, um, the fact that there just isn't enough housing to go around. There isn't enough housing of any kind uh, to go around. Okay, So that creates gentrification, which has the following effects. It hits the property values of the area in an upward way. It 
changes the revenue streams of a community. It creates a different type of income mix. It changes the demographics of an area. And it often results in a somewhat intangible and unmeasurable type of community conflict and it can be responsible for turnover within the neighborhood or what is known as displacement of low income areas. So let's look at those effects of gentrification in, in order here. First I wanted to talk about the property values. Um, the process of gentrification is such that people who are buying into areas often put some money into renovating the structures that they buy. And even if you're just renting, your landlord will start to fund improvements to the area, will start to fund physical improvements in a way that makes the area a little bit more, uh, it makes it more reasonable for them to increase the rent and to upcharge what they're already charging. Um, so part of that is is modest renovation. The other part of that is, the value of urban land is often a result of financial speculation as well. So if you're talking about Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which that's right here, by the way, this map of Brooklyn, um, you can see this part in white here is Manhattan. Um, the neighborhoods, the census tracts of Brooklyn here are coded based off of the increase in the property values, 174% in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, uh, these inner parts of Brooklyn uh, as well on the western side of the of the borough, also pretty severe increases in property uh, values. Part of that is the, in, the, the physical improvements, but another part of that, and, and don't lose track of this, is developers start to want to build in an area that seems hot, or they want to buy into an area that seems like it's getting hot. And so as a result, that extra money that's flowing into the area up, upswings the property values. The rent almost always rise accordingly. Um, cities can get in front of this in an extreme way, the way that Berlin has, or in a, a much more modest way uh, through types of rent control in, in various neighborhoods, um, which, which is really what New York uh, has done. Um, but over time, the area is going to see an increase in property values. That increase in property values generally funds a different type of revenue stream and a different type of income mix within a gentrified neighborhood and community. So the demographics of the neighborhood change and, and, and it changes racially, ethnically, but for now, let's just think about the type of person that, that's moving into an, a gentrifying area. We previously said in our definition of gentrification that um, it's the process of high income residents moving into previously low income areas. So let's take a look at what's going on on this graph here. It is the per capita income, 1990-2012, split across city centers and the entire country. So if I look at what this the per capita income in uh, U.S. city centers in 1990, you're looking at $21,000. By 2012, that was $41,000. So that's an influx in wealthier people choosing to live in cities in a bit of a reversal of what had happened over many decades uh, in the, the era of white flight and suburbanization. You can see that the growth in the other parts of the country was not nearly as serious from 26699 to 28051. The poverty rate declined in city centers from 29.3% down to 25.7% at the same time that the poverty rate throughout the country actually rose over this 22 year stretch. And the percentage of people with a college degree increased in city centers from 28.5% all the way up to 47.3%. That's almost a double of where you of, of where you previously were at, even though the share of uh, Americans with a college degree only increased from 20.3% to 28.4% in, in, in the entire country. So it's who's gentrifying? What's happening to cities? Fewer people in poverty, more money coming in, and more college educated people coming in. And that allows cities to collect much more tax revenue from these gentrified areas. In other words, it allows them to kind of slowly try to chip away and reverse at one of the core problems related to urban decay, which was that as the middle class and the upper middle class leaves, 
Cities have to do more with less. Cities in, in a period of urban decline and urban decay end up having to fund more social services with fewer tax dollars. And here, this brings tax money back into the city, although it does so in a very area-specific way. That has the added uh, effect of funding local amenities and funding local services. So whenever you've heard people saying that, ah, oh, why did it take some white people moving in? Uh, in order for the area to like start having the trash picked up and start having the parks tended to and start having much better governmental and public services in the area. I am very sympathetic to that argument, but framing it as white people is kind of missing the point. Um, that, that might be tangentially related, but it's really the fact that there's more money that exists within the area. We do live in an area in a country and we do live in cities in which money that is earned in a certain area does generally fund what's happening in that area, things like public schools, things like trash collection. Um, and, and so a gentrifying area, not wrongly, often gets known for having a higher quality of life than it once did. Now, if I was a low income, long term resident of an area that's begun to gentrify, and let's say if I was living in Williamsburg, for example, before this whole thing got underway, um, that, I suspect that that would profoundly piss me off. Um, but it is what happens. It is what happens. Um, and it's part of the reason why, uh, to kind of preview where this is going, it's part of the reason why uh, displacement is not nearly as severe as it's sometimes expected to be, because even though people People gripe about why wasn't the area cared about previously. Um, a lot of people like these changes and a lot of people grudgingly accept that, yeah, this is a higher quality of life and do what they can to hang on. But more on that uh, at a later point. So the revenue streams and the, the fact that there's a more diverse income mix, you have a much higher ceiling to the type of person that's living in city centers and, and, and these major metro areas, that creates an alteration of the revenue streams. And it's part of the reason why, you know, I, a lot of uh, people who run cities talk a big game about gentrification, but it doesn't seem to me like anybody really embedded in the growth machine has any real interest in controlling it. Um, and, and so probably the right move going forward I would suspect would be not to stop gentrification, but to try to do it in a more equitable way, but more on that at a later point. So the revenue streams are going up and the income mix is getting higher, especially like it's not that the ceiling has gotten lower. It's that the, um, it's not, oh, pardon me, it's not that the, the floor has gotten lower. It's that the ceiling has gotten larger. Okay. Now in terms of race and ethnicity, the area often but not exclusively increases its proportion of white residents and households. So let's take a look at the central district in Seattle, one of the more gentrified cities in the country. In 1970, this was a very black neighborhood, 73% black, 16% white. What happens by 2019? 62% white and 14% black. It's almost like a flipping of what the neighborhood looked like in 1970. Now, 1970 is a long time, and it would be, quite frankly, myopic to pretend that the neighborhood is not going to change at all, just in, in a normal way. Um, but that's a pretty severe turnover. That, that's a very severe uh, turnover. If you're wondering this proportion of other um, in a place like Seattle, that's likely driven by the increase, the influx of the Asian uh, population. Uh, both Asian Americans and Asian immigrants uh, both are known to live in Seattle in disproportionate numbers. So yeah, so from 16% white in 1970 to 53% uh, uh, white by the 2010 census, all the way up to 62% by 2019, that's a big deal. That's a really, really big deal. Um, however, the turnover does not have to be racialized. Um, uh, if you're looking for other cities, uh, and neighborhoods where you've seen an increase in the white non-Hispanic population. Um, a neighborhood like Jamaica Plains in Boston, a very historic, uh, historically black neighborhood in Boston, uh, has seen a pretty severe, uh, a pretty dramatic increase in uh, the white population over the past several decades. Um, I would say I would say West Philadelphia has also seen this occur. West Philadelphia, probably not Southwest Philadelphia, which always was a lot poorer than just West Philadelphia. Um, the the white population has increased in, in in West Philadelphia, just on the other side of the Schuylkill River. Um, but 
there are some interesting examples of black middle class gentrification. And so what we have seen, the two areas where this has uh, been the most written about and the most documented, Bronzeville, a neighborhood on the near south side of Chicago, which is right next to the University of, of Chicago. Um, it's a his classic historically black neighborhood um, that uh, has now seen gentrification without any measurable increase in the white population, perhaps because Chicago is so segregated to begin with that um, these things just ultimately do not um, it doesn't enter people mind, people's minds, maybe. That's always been one of the ideas about Chicago segregation is that people kind of do it to themselves. Well, yeah, they do it to themselves out of a century of history that they have in their heads about where people like me are living at and where people like me are not living. So Bronzeville has experienced a real increase in the income level. Um, and it's not hard to see why. For Black professionals, there is something, I think, very attractive about the idea of living in a classic historically meaningful black neighborhood. It's not like you're just moving. If you move to Bronzeville or you move to Harlem, New York, it's not like, that's a statement in a way. That's a statement of connecting with historical roots. Like I may not have been alive during the Harlem Renaissance, but that means a lot for my ethnic group. I mean, I'm talking in the Royal, like, you know, I think you get the point, not my ethnic group, but I, I just, I think everybody probably gets the point by now. Um, so Harlem, the income, the income mix in Harlem has gone way up. The proportion of black professionals has gone way up. Um, and so Harlem, uh, the poverty rate has gone way down in, in Harlem, uh, despite the fact that it is not racially turned over in, in any real measurable way. But by and large, uh, if we look at who has the ability to gentrify, it tends to be more skewed to whites. Not and, and for two reasons. One, there's more of us than there are of anybody else, although probably not by 2050, if you believe the census uh, designation, uh, the census predictions. There's there's just more of us. So like it, it becomes more likely in raw numbers. Um, and, and also in terms of uh, relative deprivation among minorities, there's more Blacks and more Hispanics living in poverty. Um, and, and if those people moved into poor neighborhoods, it wouldn't be classified as gentrification. So if you're following along here, and I hope you are, um, the revenue stream, the property values have gone up in a gentrifying neighborhood like Williamsburg or Harlem. The uh, revenue streams have gotten better. The income mix has increased and the uh, percentage of the white population has likely increased as well. One of the byproducts of this, of this neighborhood turnover, is that gentrification is the cause of uh, often a great deal of community conflict. Um, and that community conflict leads people to, to often very much resist it, resist both the idea of gentrification and resist the um, actual presence of individuals who are gentrifiers. I have to admit, I have always been a little agnostic about this part of it because I guess I guess in my heart, I generally accept and understand that uh, the process of social change is sometimes socially ugly. And so I, I guess I just in, in theory accept that that's gonna be part of the neighborhood turnover um, that occurs here. But also from a much more structural and, and personal standpoint, Think about the videos that I assigned to you uh, that told stories, um, like in Detroit and Cleveland, told stories about what happened to Black households that had moved into previously white areas in, say, Chicago or Cleveland or Detroit. Um, the level of abuse and harassment that was directed towards those people um, was absolutely just a preposterous level of harassment and abuse. And so if right now college educated, young college educated whites moving into um, Crown Heights, for example, which is a very recently gentrifying neighborhood of central Brooklyn, um, if, if, the, <laughs> if the payback on that is that young white families uh, have trouble making friends with their neighbors who are distrustful of them, I guess I don't feel like that's an unfair exchange. You know, I feel like that's 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 part that's part of it, right? That's part of the history here. But it's not hard to see why people living in a gentrifying neighborhood might develop 
fear and trepidation about the process. Um, first, there's fear of displacement. Spike Lee, a while back, had a tremendous rant about this, specifically related to his na his native Brooklyn, um, about how uh, the, the fear was that uh, you were going to have large-scale removal of the populations of the people that had previously relied upon what that neighborhood had to offer. And even if that neighborhood didn't have much to offer, it still provided networks, networks of survival and networks um, that, that allowed people to navigate whatever the social situation was. There's a real fear of displacement and people do have a natural fear of change. I think that's a very human characteristic for us to have. There is sometimes just resentment of change, not just because why didn't we get any attention and investment earlier, but just um, the older we get, I think the worse off we are with change of any kind that um, surrounds us. And there's a real loss of the networks. There's a real loss of co or fear of the the net, the cohesion that, that people tr want to develop in their neighborhoods and their communities. It, it does make me sad to say this, but I really do believe it. We no longer live in a country in which living next door to somebody is a meaningful thing that you have in common with that person. I always hear this from people my age who are living, you know, who have moved around and moved into certain neighborhoods. And they say, well, you know, I don't hang out with my neighbors. I'm not friends with my neighbors. We just don't have anything in common. And I always think to myself, you know, it's only recently that living next door to somebody ceased to be a thing that you had meaningfully in common uh, with them. But but there's been a real retreat from public life. There's been a retreat from public so, uh, from public social relationships to much more private lives. The number of friends we have is lower. Is lower. The number of uh, networks, uh, the, the the cohesion of our networks is lower. Um, and I don't think it's just because we move around a little bit more often than we used to. In fact, many parts of the country, people are a lot less mobile than they ever were. So if I just look at what, but if I just think about the economics of it, from 2000 to 2015, the following two things happened. Rents increased nationally 53%. Rents increased for many reasons. Um, not the least of which that landowners realized that they could charge more, they could get away with charging more. Also, laws governing real estate speculation generally were a lot lower. So There's a lot more turnover, a lot more demand in urban areas. And then I didn't mention this last time, but I probably should have. One of the, again, another one of the legacies of the Great Recession for people my age is... Um, none of us have any money saved up to actually buy a home. And that's very problematic. It's very tricky. Uh, we went, we got through our twenties. Like the, the day I graduated with my PhD, I had about $1,500 in a savings account. I was 28 and I had made, made no progress over this period of economic, uh, advancement that had occurred, you know, post, post great recession. We went back to school. We were working part-time or, or, or freelance jobs. We didn't save the money we needed. If you want to buy a home, you typically need about 20% down payment to make that happen. You got 20% of even $160,000 laying around. Yeah, I didn't either. Um, and so what this did is it a whole bunch of people that used to put money into the housing market and therefore exit the rental market never did. And that's created a lot of excess pressure on apartments that, ha and they have just not built housing stock in a way that would have lowered the price for everybody. Um, and, and so in many cities, like I remember hearing this when I moved to Charlotte, I only stayed there for a year. I wish I had stayed longer actually, but, but I only stayed there for a year. Um, and I often heard from people living there, that Charlotte's becoming a city where it's easier to buy than it is to rent because there's just a lot fewer people who want to buy than there are people who want to rent. So at some point this gets unmanageable. This gets very unmanageable. People's rents are going up, gentrifying area or non-gentrifying area. And people's incomes are not increasing in the way that they would need to in order to manage this uh, change. And that leads to the big fear of displacement, neighborhood turnover. How much displacement actually occurs as a direct result of displacement? And yes, I am using the term direct result very carefully here because 
I have moved a bunch of times in my life and it has never been because I got displaced for rising rents. People move for a ton of different reasons. So directly, the real authority on displacement in gentrifying cities is Lance Freeman, uh, who uh, recently was at Temple University. I think he has in Philadelphia, but I think he's moved to a, uh, a school in New York City now. Um, it, not a ton, actually not a ton. What we're looking at here on this graph, the probability of moving and the probability of being displaced. Let's look first at a gentrifying neighborhood. The probability of moving was, um, uh, the, uh, the probability of moving in a uh, gentrifying neighborhood uh, was 0.14% uh, and 0.1% uh, um, across the two uh, samples, right? The two cities that were being uh, examined here, New York City and Philadelphia. And in a non-gentrifying neighborhood, it only goes up slightly uh, to about 13% um, you know, on, on, on one of the samples here. So what am I looking at here with the coefficients? What am I looking at with the probability? Well, the probability of leaving a gentrifying area, right? Again, if I look at the actual odds ratio, 1.4% for a gentrifying area, which is only a little bit higher of 0.9% for a non-gentrifying neighborhood. So this isn't a major difference here. Displacement is one of those things that it absolutely occurs, but not nearly the way that we tend to think that it does. And that's because there are a lot of reasons why somebody might move. There's just a lot of reasons why somebody might end up having to move. Um, if you go back here, the probability of moving 14%, 13%, the probability of being displaced is far lower than the probability of moving. So I want you to think about why one might move over the course uh, of their lives or over the course of their tenure within a city. I moved from Yonkers to Philadelphia to go to college, and I moved from Philadelphia to um, Columbus in order to go to uh, grad school, and I moved from Columbus to Charlotte for work, and I moved from Charlotte to Ann Arbor for work. Um, so none of that dealt with displacement. None of that, just because you are leaving an area does not mean it's a result of direct displacement. So people move all the time for new jobs. People move all the time for family reasons to be because either because I'm starting a family or to be closer to the family of origin uh, for myself or maybe for a spouse. Um, LOL on that for me. Um, we uh, uh, people move for school. That's the primary reason why I've moved throughout my life is to either attend different schools or to go to different schools. They might move because they have new priorities. They might just not need the place, the assets of their neighborhood the way that they used to or because new housing just opened up somewhere else. A study of New York City and Boston actually found that poor residents in a gentrifying neighborhood became 20% less likely to move during gentrification. Um, and again, if you look at this, this graph here, um, the, the percentage of uh, residential, uh, residential mobility in San Francisco, a very gentrified city, um, persons one year and older living in the same household as one year ago. Um, the southern parts of, of San Francisco and the Southern Bay, um, the darker it is, the more people, like the less turnover that there is. But but there's a lot of just normal turnover in the course of San Francisco. And, and so part, that can't entirely be as a result of displacement. A lot of that is just we move throughout the life course. We always have and we generally always will. And so how do we make sense of this pa somewhat paradoxical finding of New York City and Boston? Um, well, generally, what the quali there's been qualitative studies of these two cities, of New York and Boston, of Portland, Oregon, another high gentrification city, and of Chicago. Um, and what is found is that people, even if they're grumbling about what is happening, people generally want to stay in the neighborhood that A, is my home, and B, is a place that is now actually improving. And why am I going to try to leave that? Like, if I have any chance of holding on, I often will. So there are three factors that actually serve to limit immediate displacement. The first is the fact that urban and neighborhoods always have a high turnover rate. Um, a recent study by um, the uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics found that over a five-year span, 50% of all urban residents move anyway. There's just a lot of turnover to begin with. Um, so people are moving and it's not necessarily a result of displacement, even if that might become a displacing factor at a later point. 
point. Second reason is that gentrifying neighborhoods often have a lot of uh, high initial vacancy. So that allows it, newcomers to fill those vacant units without actually displacing anybody. If you look at a very highly gentrified neighborhood, uh, Boston South, that South End, pretty interesting neighborhood actually, that was 25% vacant in 1970. Now by 2010, 2% vacant. So now, only now is really the point in which you're going to see the prices spike to the point where, uh, where uh, to the point where um, displacement might might start occurring. And then, very interestingly, collective efficacy. Neighborhoods have the ability to organize to save residents that might be threatened by displacement or might be thre uh, threatened by uh, displacement of, of any kind. Um, so a neighborhood that has been particularly adept at doing this um, is the is Chinatown in New York City, um, which is sort of New York's last like real thriving immigrant community. Manhattan's at least. There's plenty in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx. Um, and, and so what you're seeing, there's so much collective advocacy. There's very tightly knit relationships in Chinatown. Um, people generally rent apartments on the basis of personal relationships there. And it really stops potential gentrifiers in their tracks because they cannot get an influx. They, they cannot get a, an entry point into the neighborhood's rental market. It's too difficult to navigate the ethnic, uh, the cultural, uh, it's, it's too difficult to navigate the, the customs of the area. It's too difficult to develop the cultural capital that's needed to do business and to, uh, uh, to rent in a place like Chinatown. So you kind of rely upon personal relationships. And that's why Chinatown, despite occupying potentially very very valuable urban land has stayed very Chinese for decades and decades and decades. Um, and it's even, Chinatown's actually expanding, believe it or not. It's almost like it's a working class immigrant neighborhood that's actually expanding instead of getting eaten, getting eaten up uh, by gentrifiers. Um, if you've ever been to that part of lower Manhattan, you'll know that Chinatown is right next to uh, Little Italy. Once a thriving neighborhood of 40 ethnic Italian, uh, 40 blocks of ethnic Italian households, it's been reduced to essentially one street of uh, restaurants and bakeries. And that's it. And, and that's because the Italians didn't really organize in the way that the Chinese did. The Italians became white like anybody else and moved to the suburbs. Um, so uh, Chinatown has for, for years now been kind of creeping into Little Italy. Like you go to Little Italy and, and neighborhoods that used to be very Italian, you're seeing more and more Chinese characters there. Um, the same thing is happening in the opposite direction um, from Little Italy where you're seeing Chinatown creep into parts of the Lower East Side. And that shows you that um, neighborhoods that are particularly, that might have been uh, vulnerable to gentrification, these are neighborhoods that can, in many cases, organize. Uh, and, and so as a result, my finding has always been that displacement is not a direct relationship, but it absolutely exists. And when it hits, it can hit somewhat hard. Um, raw numbers can be very high. And so, and those people have legitimate stories to tell, even when the rates are, are very low, even when the rates are maybe not statistically significant. Um, the, the city of New York itself admits and 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 uh, and has published data to, to the effect of 10,000 people every year being displaced due to rising rents. New York City has over 8 million people living in it. 8 million people in New York City. And so 10,000 is a fraction of a percent of 8 million, but is that now somehow meaningless to say that, okay, there isn't a lot of displacement, but those 10,000 people have to go somewhere now. Those 10,000 people got to go somewhere else. So what's going on? How, how do some, how do these people hold on? How do people who might be prone to displacement resist that displacement? Well, there's a lot of ways, but in New York, there's less displacement than maybe in a place like DC because a lot of units are rent controlled. And what rent control means is that it limits the percentage increase that your landlord is legally allowed to charge you on a year to year basis to stay in your unit. And so what that does, it allows me to say, okay, your rent has gone up 3% or your rent has gone up 2.5%. 
percent. I cannot say your rent has gone up 300 percent because I want to get you the fuck out of this area and I want to get richer people here that will pay a hell of a lot more. Um, a lot of New York City is rent controlled. Um, and, and so that has allowed many people to hold on, even as gentrification has occurred in their neighborhood. It hasn't actually displaced them from parts of uh, Brooklyn and, and, um, and, and, and upper Manhattan. That allows many people to hold on and is probably something for a lot of cities to look into, especially now, especially with so many people getting laid off. Um, a nation, national legislation to freeze, to, to freeze rent increases would be a very wise policy to pursue, I, I think. Um, also, home ownership is a part of this. The fact that you see uh, San Francisco has had a lot of uh, gentrification and not a ton of displacement, largely because home ownership was so high. And so one of the ways to protect working class areas or black areas from displacement is to maybe pursue policies that increase home ownership in those, in those communities and in those areas, because then they can't be displaced by rising rents. The only thing that can affect them there is rising property taxes, which, you know, to be clear is, is a, is a threat and is a worry, but neighborhoods have proven to be able to weather it in, in, in places like San Francisco. Um, San Francisco had very high home ownership. And as a result, those people, if anything, saw a benefit from uh, the insane spike in property values. But it doesn't allow anybody new to move into that neighborhood that previously might have been the type of person that would have moved into uh, a, a lower income neighborhood. Municipalities can offer subsidies. My understanding is that Minneapolis is offering subsidies to people to stay in their in their uh, areas, even if they can't afford it, like make it so that way they can afford it. Um, and, and, and why would they do that? Well, you know, the, there is something lost when there's a very high turnover in a neighborhood. It ends up robbing the city of so much of its dynamism and so much of its institutional knowledge. Um, so some cities will offer subsidies to allow others to continue uh, to stay in neighborhoods maybe that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to afford. Our generation, mine and yours, is doubling up all the time. Like a lot of you are going to end up living with roommates throughout your 20s. So doubling up, tripling up, living in uh, overcrowded units has always been a way that people lived in urban areas when they personally couldn't afford it. Maybe four or five of us together can afford New York City. Sometimes you work it out with your landlord or sometimes you just grit your teeth and pay more. And that's probably what the modal outcome here is. It's probably what is most common is for people to just ultimately pay more. So not many people are directly displaced, but here's how the process of neighborhood transition happens. When they move, they are not replaced by households of the same class. The gentrification process moves newer, higher income residents into the area. And over a 20 to 30 year time frame sometimes much more rapid in the case of, say, um, San Francisco, uh, the area just gets inaccessible. You'll have an area that was previously known as a place that low-income residents and households could live and still live in cities. And now over time, they can't access those neighborhoods anymore. So that forces them out into other areas. If I look at the data here, this is the probability a renter will move involuntarily, either through displacement or eviction or whatever in, in over a two year uh, uh, time frame. in a, let me see what is going on here, down here, uh, down here at the bottom, I gotta move this. Among all renters, the probability of moving involuntarily is 13%. Among renters in gentrifying neighborhoods, it, the uh, probability of moving involuntarily is 15.6%. So this is sort of happening everywhere, and it's only very slightly higher in a gentrifying area. Over time, though, I cannot stress this enough, the area turns over to become a gentrified area. That used to be a place. It's not so much that the long-term residents themselves are being, hard, are being harmed. What gentrification does is it cuts off a neighborhood of opportunity for low-income residents who simply can't afford these prices anymore. And when displacement does occur, people are shown to rarely move to a neighborhood that's as good 
or better than the neighborhood that they've been forced out of. They often move to a much worse neighborhood. And so the gentrification puzzle, I almost wish we had a different word for that because gentrification makes it sound very British to me and I don't like that. Um, if you it, it's almost like it's the other side of concentrated poverty. It's, it's concentrated urban wealth. That's what you're creating through gentrification. And so what this creates is a greater likelihood that we'll see concentrated poverty because the poor people who maybe just got ejected don't have anywhere to go except a, a, a neighborhood of concentrated poverty. And so if I conceptualize it that way, context is key. Context is key. Where are people ultimately going? Um, I only want to think about gentrification as it relates to concentrated poverty. I want to conceptualize those two things together. And that leads me to a discussion of much like a 30,000 foot uh, discussion of just urban inequality and national inequality. We know that's going up. So why is it a surprise to people that that has effects at the neighborhood level? In my opinion, gentrification, it's not, it's not strictly speaking or really the problem in urban inequality. And it is definitely not the solution because it's going to create just as many problems as it fixes. But, but something I really want you to think of, like gentrification, it's, it is... What's mildly amusing to me is how often the people who are the most vocal resistors of gentrification and the loudest critics of gentrification are often people who were they themselves gentrifiers um, at a previous time. And so the second they move in, they start to complain about gentrification over and above them. Uh, and so it reminds me of that famous French quote from uh, Louis the Louis the Fourteenth or Louis the whatever, um, who said uh, it, it's in French, but it translates to "After me, the flood." Like once I get my, I, I I've moved into this area. I'm not the problem. Everybody else is the problem. And neighborhoods and, and communities will never develop collective efficacy as long as that is something that uh, it, that is in existence. Um, Part of the reason why I'm very agnostic about gentrification is if I just run through the, the list of things that are occurring in urban areas, if we believe that concentrated poverty is bad and we believe that deindustrialization is bad because it's created such a serious skills mismatch and we believe that spatial mismatch and segregation is bad and, and we believe that reinvestment now along the lines of, of gentrification is bad and displacement is bad and the neighborhood transition is bad, I often wonder um, if that doesn't leave us paralyzed. Doesn't that leave us somewhat paralyzed? Um, and so with that in mind, I, I encourage you to think about that as you write for the, uh, as you write the paper for Friday. What I don't want to see is a paper that talks about how bad gentrification is. I'm more than happy to read and to listen to a discussion of the negative effects of gentrification with evidence to back that up. But do understand that like leaving neighborhoods the way that they are, there's a reason why it was low income in the first place. And, and I need you to understand that because it's very easy to criticize gentrification as a type of colonization. And I just think that's myopic. I think that's just a hopelessly naive way to look at, at urban areas. Think about what can be done at the level of cities and communities that creates a more equitable city across the board that allows for reinvestment, perhaps without screwing the poor. I realize that's way easier said than done, but again, it's I, I will be I will grade papers very harshly uh, that I feel are constructing straw man arguments. Okay, I, I want to see some nuance in this one specifically, because if I think about this issue, like I can see the public housing project, the, che the Elliott Chelsea Homes serving a purpose for people. And I can see that school that's right across the street from it also serving a purpose for people. So I'd like to see a very clear uh, treatment. I'd like to see a very thoughtful treatment of ultimately what's going on there. Um, Thank you and good night. Uh, appreciate your attention and I appreciate your hard work on my behalf. Keep it up, guys. Bye-bye.